In this episode, you'll learn about a new design material which might hold the secret to designing services that don't fade away over time. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Josina, and this is The Service Design Show, episode 95. Hi, my name is Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to design organizations that put people at the heart of their business. The guest in this episode is Josina Fink. Josina is a researcher, designer and teacher. And the reason I'm so excited to have her on this episode is that we're going to talk about a recurring theme over the last few episodes. And that is how do you actually get services implemented. Josina has done a lot of research about this on this and one of the key ingredients are social structures and also moving from designing of services to designing for services. So that's what we're going to talk about in this episode. And if you stick around till the end, you're going to get away with knowing what's beyond the double diamond and there is a lot more. If you find these videos helpful, make sure to click that subscribe button and that bell icon because we bring a new video at least once a week to help you level up your service design skills. So that's all for the intro. And now let's quickly jump into the chat with Josina. Welcome to the show, Josina. Thanks, Mark. Happy to be here. Awesome to have you on. You had an amazing uh, presentation at the global conference. So I feel lucky that you're also starring today on the service <laughs> design show for the people who haven't seen your presentation and don't know who you are. Could you give like a 30 second introduction? Sure. Uh, happy to. My name's Josina Vink and I have a background as a service and systems designer, mostly working in Canada, in the US in healthcare uh, and have since moved to Sweden and then now in Norway. So a bit of the kind of North American and Scandinavian influence around service design. Um, just finished up my PhD with a focus on service design. And now I'm an associate professor here at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design. And I do research and teaching on service design. And my focus is mostly around health and care. Hmm. It, uh, your last name sounds a bit Dutch, not a bit. It sounds Dutch. It is Dutch. It's Dutch. <laughs> uh, all of my grandparents, uh, yeah, immigrated to Canada from the Netherlands. I, some of them, I think, were given candy by the Canadian <laughs> soldiers uh, at a certain point. So I think they had a sweet spot, quite literally, for Canada. Mm. So all right. uh, I'm well, a product of that. <laughs> that's a fun fact we didn't know about you. Mm, um, totally. Do you remember your very first memory of service design? When did you get in touch with it? <clears throat> I mean, I have quite a broad understanding of service design. So the, for me, and it wasn't called kind of service originally, but that was part of the thinking. I had always, I had my heart set on being a physician, being a primary care doctor. And then after kind of doing my undergrad and thinking about things, I went, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Patch Adams with Robin Williams, I uh, but it's this guy uh, who has um, a fun hospital. And he, the idea is that, you know, patients are the doctors and the doctors are patients and everything is, he kind of reinvents uh, how the healthcare system works. And I went to visit the real Patch Adams in West Virginia for a month and he he and the kind of institute, Gesundheit Institute there introduced the idea that design, you can design your relationships, you can design the structures, not just the building of the hospital, but you can actually kind of design the ways in which we exchange service. So that would just kind of sparked up. Oh, maybe I don't want to be a doctor. Maybe I actually want to think about how we shape uh, things in these health and care relations. So that was mm. what got me onto it. And I guess they didn't use the word service design back then. <laughs> no. Not at all. Uh, and yeah, I think I was practicing service design before I yeah. got any label well, for it, of course. Uh, we should we should get a T-shirt with that because that's what everybody says. Like I was doing service design because I realized it was called that way. They, if anybody has a good idea for a T-shirt, well, this this ma <laughs> make it this one. Mm, totally. Anywho, um, 
you've sent me some really interesting uh, chats and it will be a little bit different than we usually do, I think, on the show. Well, every episode is different, but this one will be for sure. I've sent you a few of the famous service design show question mm -hmm. starters. And as always, we're going to do some interview jazz. Ready to start? I'm so ready. I was born yeah. ready. Let's go. Good. So the first topic, ladies and gentlemen, that we're going to address da -da 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 -da. is called social structures. Mm -hmm. Josina, do you have a question starter? Hmm, let's see. Okay, let's go with this one. How can we? Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, how can we uh, become aware of social structures and intentionally shape them in our service design processes? What do you see when you close your eyes and think about social structures? Hmm. Very good question. I see this like invisible glue between us as humans that is kind of like keeping us stuck together. And I also see this like big uh, wind blowing device that's kind of like guiding our direction in a certain way. So it's these like things that are moving us that we're not fully aware of um, and that it kind of connects us between people. But is yeah. Mm. Hmm. Interesting question. Hmm invisible glue that holds us together mm -hmm. uh, and because of this amazing explanation i forgot what the rest of your question was so how should how how can how we, we become be more, aware yeah, yeah how do we become aware as service designers of that right mm. yeah totally and and then to shape them because if we're going okay. to actually adjust how these things inform us we have to be aware of them first why, why is this on your mind why are why is this mm. an important topic for you because for me, and I know a couple episodes back, you had a conversation with Lynn Vissard about implementation and some of these challenges of moving, actually getting service design to stick. And for me, this is part of like a key to that conversation. And if we, I have had so many experiences where myself and my team members have spent so much time crafting this kind of like perfect service mm. offering mm. and addressing all the touch points and trying to get it exactly what would make sense to, for a good patient experience or whatever that might be. And uh, then in the long term, it kind of gets eroded or um, it actually just gets rejected by the culture of the organization that we're trying to put it in and so for me if we don't pay attention to the social structures which are the kind of norms and rules and roles that are guiding people then one our thing might not get adopted in the first our service design kind of won't get adopted in the first place but also if we don't actually restructure those things then it it will get eroded over time it doesn't become entrenched in socially how we do things so um i'm curious like why is this more important, for instance, for service designers than, I don't know, product designers? Or mm -hmm. like if I would have somebody else on the show, they, they would say uh, we should be looking at the financial aspects and we should be looking. So why, why, mm -hmm. why social structures? For you. Yeah, I mean, okay, a couple of things on your question. I am a person who sees service design, product design is not necessarily something that's separate from service design. I see product as a means that service can be exchanged. Sure. So my view of service is like an exchange of knowledge and skills. That's what service is, and a product could be a way of doing that. So in that way, I, for me, it's fundamental to service is how people interact and how we exchange this knowledge and skills and what's guiding how we do that are social structures. Mm -hmm. So the only way that you and I know how to have a conversation or know how to relate is because we have some shared social structures. We introduced ourselves uh, when we first started talking. And even though we've grown up in very different places, we still know how to relate and exchange knowledge and skills. And that's because we have this kind of basic norms and roles between us. One person speaks and the other person listens and those things. So that is service exchange. And yeah, it, these are the guiding principles of service exchange. So they yeah. are the kind of key for service design. One, one of my favorite sayings that I've been using over the last time is that I see organizations as our design material, mm. but basically what you're saying is that social structures are also a design material. Yeah, so actually I'm in an academic role now. So if you look into the academic literature, 
organizations are actually made up of social structures. So in that way, if you're interested in seeing organizations as material, how we organize, the ways of organizing and getting that to stick is actually social structures. An organization itself is a form of a social structure. We have rules in place mm -hmm. around what an organization is. We have norms and culture around it. So we're totally on the same page, I think, mm. when you're thinking about mm. that. And then, and then comes the question, like, um, if we want to become, what's the word, more fluent or more mm. uh, skilled, literate, or, yeah. literate with mm. this design material, where should we start? Because I think it's not something that is being thought in yeah. service design schools, uh, yeah. if that's the thing. I, uh, I'm trying to teach my students now, so Very we're, good. We're, we're trying to get there, but I, I agree. Um, it was not something that I was taught and um, not something that many people are taught. So I've been exploring different methods of doing this. So one of the ways that I do this is often like take a, a story that might be typical or that I might have gotten from an interview and then use that as a reflective tool for people to actually unpack what are the norms that might have led to this kind of story or what are the underlying beliefs in how they're talking to each other. And this is might be a way to help us unpack some of those things. And also, I've been using kind of the metaphor of the iceberg that's fairly typical uh, as a way to unpack a kind of service system to say, think, OK, what's on the surface of the iceberg are the physical things that we can exchange. So you might see tables and chairs in a, in a room. And then what's underneath that are the kind of social structures. So the norms around, OK, we sit around a table. The person at the head of the table might have a certain degree of power. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that how we sit and sitting is this kind of norm. So you can kind of use some of the physical ways in which uh, an interaction happens or an environment is, and then try and go from there as a way to unpack things. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm exploring different tools and ways uh, of uh, doing that and bringing that into the kind of service design process and vocabulary. And for the people who are interested in this, uh, you've sort of already uh, did the hard work and dissect social structures into mm -hmm. more fundamental building blocks, right? You already mentioned yeah, a totally. few, but um, if people are interested in this, uh, check out your presentation at the mm -hmm. Global Service Design Conference because there you explain the pyramid and how it works and what the building blocks are, right? That would be a yeah, good exactly. a good starting mm -hmm. point, I guess. Yeah, and I think so there it gets at this like regulative aspects that, you know, when we talk about policy and rules, the normative aspects like roles and, and norms, and then the more like cultural cognitive like beliefs and values and things like that. And I think, yeah, seeing the, the kind of breadth of those social structures can help us really tap into them in a better way. All right. So many questions about this one, but I'm uh, sure that the other topics will be interesting as well. Yeah. So let's move into topic uh, number two, Okay. which um, I'm surely ties into the first one because this one is called Collectives. Ah. Okay, uh, why? I'll, I'll go with why. Mm -hmm. um, why aren't we already considering collectives in design? That's my question. Oh, um, what kind of collectives? Yeah, so I have a hunch and from my experience, a sense that design is quite individual focused. Like we, we make a user journey of one user typically moving through a service. Um, and so I'm meaning collectives of different, a group of people and how they relate to each other, as opposed to just making services that improve one person's experience, actually understanding how that affects a group and the relations of those um, people when we're thinking about that. Hmm. And, and, okay, uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about like where, when I'm designing, uh, I'm usually thinking about a group of people not just one person well mm -hmm. the person is the group is represented by a person yeah so what's yeah, the yeah. Uh, how is the difference good good thank you for that question yeah so i'm not talking about like a group of individuals that might be like a user segment or something mm -hmm. like that that mm -hmm. it, i'm thinking about um the collectives that that 
maybe user might be a part of like families could be a collective or neighborhood okay. within that as a collective. So shifting from this kind of segmented customers mm -hmm. to actually seeing how people are embedded in collectives in an existing way. So not just designing bank services for an individual, but thinking about families when we're thinking about kind of how we're doing service um, design or thinking about the implications when at the moment we're working on a project that is a service design project for transferring services from the hospital and primary care into the home. So are we thinking about the unintended consequences of that, not just for the patient? It could be a great experience for the patient to be at home instead of the hospital. But what does that mean for a family member who then has to live in a hospital-like setting at home? Or what does it mean for the, their anxiety that a nurse isn't so close or so nearby? And then what does it mean for the neighbor or their jobs? And so really, I'm, and I don't have the answer to this one yet. It's something that I'm kind of setting out into explore is can we develop approaches and ways of thinking that really appreciate this relational collective quality and the things that kind of emerge from relations as opposed to looking at kind of the person as a unit of analysis and expecting that we'll kind of get it right with that focus. Hmm. And well, I, I guess um, this makes uh, this, this, this uh, abstracts, it, abstracts it to another level. It, it becomes even more holistic, the design process, which, which can uh, be enriching, but also more challenging. Like, where do you start? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess the insights from, that you gain from understanding that somebody is mm -hmm. part of a family and that brings a certain dynamic into mm -hmm. play allows you to make better design decisions that fit somebody's habitat. Yeah, and I think part of that is like a zooming in and out a mm -hmm. little bit. Like, yeah, we can't always stay in all of the collectives that someone is a part of, and that can get too complex. But zooming out to understand those relations and then zooming in to understand the kind of smaller units, I think can help us drive at that. But I also think if we're if we don't recognize the blindness of our arbitrary boundary focusing on the individual, then I do think we have more unintended consequences mm. than if we do zoom out mm. and really appreciate the embedded relations mm. that this person is a part of. So yeah, I think so, it's our responsibility. So right, thinking on the on the fly, I don't know if that's an actual English saying, uh, but thinking on the fly, what what I'm seeing is that uh, I can imagine a design process where you sort of set certain design principles for the collective uh, yeah. level. Yeah. And then when you go down one level to make it more specific to specific user groups, you take those collective design principles into account and then mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that. I think that's, that. a, that's I, a cool idea. Well, thank um, you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Somebody needs to prototype it mm -hmm. <laughs> or already has. Yes, um, I'm sure. Have you seen any um, inspiring examples? Um, you just mentioned one where this mm. is happening. Yeah, I mean, I, you've had Sarah Schulman on the show with yes, In With Forward, did. and I think In With Forward is a good example of a group that is really concentrating on communities and uh, how ecosystems are supporting um, some of that work and thinking about the relationships between individuals and yeah, even some of the work that Sarah did um, before in Australia was very much focused on kind of families and relations and things like that. So I think, yeah, that's one great example mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. a more kind of collective focus in the design process and a way of engaging and being with communities as opposed to just extracting kind of insights from particular individuals. So. I think in with forward for sure is is one, but and, and I think others are talking about it. And there's others that are calling themselves more community-based service designers or people that work, of course, in participatory um, approaches and and service design. But I think still we need to get even a little clearer that it's not just participation from an individual frame and with an individual perspective, but really getting more at that sort of relational um, quality of collectives. Um, because I, and and I'm interested in part also because I think we have a, quite a Western bias, and I'm interested in the idea of decolonizing service design. Yeah, and I think 
you know, the Western cultural model and in here in Norway, for example, it's very individual focused just in general. So that's a cultural bias that as we're kind of going out into other places and I'm working now with a service design student uh, and we're going to be going to uh, Shanghai to do some service design work there. And so what will it mean for us to consider a more collective culture um, and how does service design adapt to those things? And, mm. and I think people are already doing, I'm not at all guessing that we're going to solve it or have the answers. I think we have a lot to learn from more collective cultures around the ways that they're designing. If people listening or watching the show have some good, inspiring stories, please share them in the comments. Yes. Uh, we would love to know. Um, that would be great. You already hinted upon uh, this one uh, in the previous two topics, but the third topic is about who is designing? <laughs> Can I? This is already a question, maybe. Tell me. Um, it, yeah. Okay, but you... I. Yeah. So who who is designing? Um, what do you mean? We are designing. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I w was taught about you know designers designing, but. As I, in my PhD research, I got out into the field, I observed service designers designing in healthcare in Experio Lab in Sweden, but then I also observed uh, folks in the healthcare system and recognizing they're also doing designing mm. of these services on the fly. Mm -hmm. I saw one uh, physician who I was observing before he went out and did uh, rounds um, in the clinic, uh, in the infection ward. He reoriented how he took the information from the electronic health record so that he could talk to patients in a different way. And then I actually realized after that observation that he, as he kind of took a chocolate from this board uh, in the hallway, that at, at the discharge nurse had left a chocolate to incentivize him to set early discharge dates so that they could plan. So both he was designing how he interacted with patients because he knew that this, what he had written down in his paper would influence his conversation. But the discharge nurse was also designing the service right. by incentivizing with chocolate saying, you know, you need to set this early so we can plan and have a smoother transition out of the hospital. And this is design work. And I think if we deny that as design and the everyday kind of aspects of design, I think we're doing a disservice. Mm. Um, and we're, it's just reinforces this very uh, corporate Western model of design that is undermining design that already exists in communities and in uh, different uh, yeah, different cultures and ways of being. So I think there's a lot, a lot of value we could get from actually just appreciating the kind of ongoing and continuous process of designing that everybody is doing in their uh, daily life. Yeah, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure who said it, uh, but I think the saying is like, there is no, no design, there's just good design or bad design, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Although. I, I, yeah. Uh, to, to, to jump in on that, I am like a bit anti the idea of like good service design and bad service design. And I know that this is like there's some new books coming out um. on this. And but for me and I think it has value. I'm not at all. I think we can become more literate about what makes uh, a good experience in a service and things like that. But that to me also gets at like one cultural lens and mm -hmm. one kind of context that if mm -hmm. we develop principles for what is good service design and what's bad service design, that doesn't necessarily un like accommodate all different contexts and all different perspectives or people with diverse needs uh, in that. And sometimes I think there are tensions. So if we say all design is contextual, uh, all service design is contextual. What about stoplights? Isn't it good to have like common stoplights across Europe that we can all understand and have that interaction? So it's, yeah, I think mm -hmm. there's tensions and we need to be thinking and challenging what we think is good to understand the way that other communities and other people are also understanding good and that that might be different. Mm. Uh, and really having conversations about that and not just making assumptions that our understanding of good can be universally applied. I want to go back to a point you made about um, uh, everybody is already designing whether mm. they know it or not. Um, mm. And you mentioned, I'm going to refer back to your presentation again at the global conference. You mentioned something about intent that really triggered me. Mm. Like for me, um, design is all about intent. Yeah. Um, 
in, like the doctor that she just mentioned or the nurse with the chocolate like if she does just that it might she she, she might be doing that with uh, a certain outcome in mind but once she starts doing those kind of things with intent then for me at least it really becomes design and what, what's do you mm. see that relationship as well totally for me that's the boundary unintentional and intentional at the heart of design is intent and i don't think that means that we have intended outcomes it's more just like that our aim is intended when we're when we're shaping with intention around a particular um, mm -hmm. direction, that to me is the differentiator. If we're just acting and reproducing back to the social structures thing, if we're just kind of reproducing social structures or ca carrying out a service exchange uh, in the way that you know is entrenched in our, our society, I don't think that is, and maybe even just reacting in a way without intention that might be changing something. For me, that's not design. Things can change without design, but design is really about that intentionality. Exactly. And and is it our role more and more to um, label this and uh, show mm. people that they can actually do this with intent and then in yeah. that way help them to, mm. to become more informed designers? I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious of this one. I've been grappling with it for a while. Like, is, is it best that we really just enhance this kind of collective intentionality around design? And I think in many regards, that's really what a goal of a service designer, as I see it, could be, is really enhancing collective intentionality to shape a service system. Um, but if we're like becoming super aware of social structures and hyper intentional all the time, might that become a really difficult system to navigate? Mm. Uh, um, it, it, and if we don't have some of that collectivity, so maybe it's back, maybe they all actually thread into each other a little bit that we need the kind of forming of collective intentionality as well to actually build that kind of design process in a way that works. But I think as designers, for me, that's one key evolution um, moving from just designing services and these particular offerings to actually tapping into everybody's ability to design and helping them do that more strategically and intentionally, and maybe even shifting some of the power dynamics around who gets to shape these service systems that we're in. I, I, yeah, I like the word collective intent. Then it, it almost starts like, sounds like a movement, right? And we, mm -hmm. we know what movements look like. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But we can have bad movements as sure. well. well bad, yeah. uh, that, no, Who are we to, to, to judge but, what yeah, is yeah, good and bad, right? Yeah. With uh, consequences that we don't like. Sure. But yes, I think that is there is power in this sort of collective intentionality to mm. change things. And, and maybe also this ties into, well, everything starts, starts tying into each other. Like mm -hmm. if you're designing for a user segment with a specific intent, but w which might be conflicting with collective yeah. intent, then... Totally. Right then, then yeah, and that's where the social structures come in too. I think if the co if the collective intent is to actually maintain certain social structures that are already taking place, then there is that conflict. But I think recognizing that conflict is a really powerful thing in the design process, and really working with that misalignment potentially between the things we want to bring into the world and take place and the collective intent hmm. um, that might be existing, and really make that part of what we're designing and working with. Is there something that you'd like to ask us, the viewers and listeners of the show? Is there anything that we can think about and help you maybe answer a question? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I mean, there's a few things on the last couple of ones. I think, as you mentioned before, like if you have strategies around recognizing collectives, tapping into collectives, methods and approaches you've been toying with that are more about relations um, or exploring some of that domain, I'd be super excited to hear about them or projects. Um, and in that regard too, I think examples from other cultures and contexts, indigenous ways of designing that factor in collectives would be really great to bring into the public discourse a little bit more. And then on the last question, I would love to hear if anybody is really working with that notion of everybody designing in their everyday life and helping people build that kind of intentionality and, and capacity and what that sort of literacy around service design looks like, recognizing that everybody's doing it and just helping them become more literate. Mm. So if anybody has any ideas around how to do that or ways in which it hasn't worked, I think that would be 
I would love to hear and be super excited. Really, please, people, comment comment on uh, on this episode. And I have one more question uh, for you um, regarding everything we've discussed. Like mm-hmm. most examples that you've given are sort of uh, in a uh, non-commercial environment. Mm-hmm. Is that by coincidence? It, uh... mm. <laughs> Uh, are you gonna yeah you're gonna make me disclose my ideology so i have a background in business as well as design and i've always been critical of the organizational structures of business and the ways in which we've given them rights and what that means and how that has worked for our social systems and our environmental systems Uh, and so i'm pretty intentional about the work that i'm doing trying not to feed into that kind of capitalist system, although it is in inadvertently anyway, I'm not at all saying that. Um, I don't think it necessarily doesn't apply in that context, but actually I'm interested in furthering it in spaces outside sure. of that due to my own kind of vision and co- hope for shared collective intentionality around um, that. But I think there's a lot of applicable spaces in the, I think if you're looking to commercialize a service, for example, you need to understand the social structures that are in place in an existing service system. If you're gonna try and scale it, that's pretty fundamental. You might need to adjust some of the structures of your service system based on contexts and things like that. So I think there's a lot of relevance, but I'm, not so interested in it and I, yeah that's not where i'm placing and investing my time but fair, yeah fair enough I, fair enough um <laughs> if people want to learn more about this and maybe get in touch with you what's the best way to do so oh they can connect with me on twitter it's just at josina vink um that's probably best or linkedin is also okay all right and any of your publications next to the mm. global conference presentation is where can they find those? Yeah, if actually, if you just look up my name on ResearchGate, they're all there. So people can happily, yeah, any of my written work and my PhD that kind of brings a lot of this work together, you can fully access that. And in the appendix has a bunch of methods for working with social structures and, awesome. and things like that. So cool. Great. Well, Jacina, thanks for enlightening us with uh, these topics today. and giving us even more to think about and making service design more, even more holistic, which is, uh, which is always a good thing. So thanks. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Mark. I hope you enjoyed this chat with Josina and don't forget to leave a comment down below and share this episode with somebody who might find it helpful as well. That way you'll not only help to grow the service design show community, but also help me to invite more inspiring guests like Josina for you. If you want to continue watching more inspiring service design thought leaders, check out this next episode because we're going to continue over there.